and welcome to another segment of the Turtis Pavlov Project. In this se segment, I'm going to talk about teaching aids that actually interfere with learning. That seems kind of weird. Why, uh, if we uh, use a teaching aid, presumably it's going to help help promote learning. Uh, let's begin now. Uh, I'm most familiar with uh, learning to play a string instrument. The first step in learning to play a string instrument, or one fundamental task, is tuning your instrument. And uh, that uh, turns out to be a pretty difficult task. There are actually two kinds of things that you have to learn to play a string instrument. One is you have to learn to make really fine auditory discriminations. The notes are not given to you the, the way they are on the piano. You have to create the pitch um, by what you do, and it begins with tuning the strings to the right, right pitch. And that has become really easy for people to do, because now there are all kinds of electronic devices uh, that help you with the task. Well, what, what do these, how do these devices work? Well, if you want to tune to an A, you uh, dial that up on the device, and it has a needle of some sort. And if uh, your string is of a higher pitch, the needle is on one side, if it's a lower pitch, it's on the other side. And so what you're doing is you adjust the pitch of your instrument to align the needle with uh, the target, and then once it does, you get the right pitch. In doing that, interestingly enough, you're shortcutting the process of learning fine auditory discriminations. What you have in that situation are two cues. One is visual given to you by the tuning device. Uh, a visual cue that's really easy to use. That We all know how to sort of adjust things so that they make the needle hit the, hit the right spot. That's pretty easy. The other is the auditory discrimination of trying to judge when the string is in tune. So you've got two cues, a visual cue that's easy to learn about, and an auditory cue that's really hard to learn about. When you put two, those two cues are present at the same time, the one that's easier to learn about is going to interfere with learning about the other one. Phenomenon is, was actually discovered by Ivan Pavlov, and it was called overshadowing. Uh, the presence of an easy-to-learn stimulus can overshadow learning about the other one. So you're actually interfering with the learning, with, with having someone learn how to tune their instrument by allowing them to use a uh, visual prompt like that. Uh, what you need to do is to, you, you can use the visual prompt to provide feedback for the correct response, but you've got to make, people have to make the judgment uh, without that visual cue. You also see this in, uh, uh, commonly in, in how kids are taught to read. Uh, we give kids uh, who haven't learned to read yet, we give them a picture book. You know, it'll have animals of various sorts. They'll have a picture of a cow and a word of a cow underneath it. And the next one will be a dog with the word of a dog underneath it. And, and as you're flipping through the page, you call out cow and kid, kid says cow and say, oh good, and you go on to the next one. You think you're teaching a kid how to read. In fact, all you're teaching him is to name the picture correctly. The picture is, learning how to name the picture is a lot easier than learning how to read the word. And so having the picture there is actually interferes with learning to read. <laughs> and people have demonstrated that in, in experimental studies. So you have to be really careful about those sorts of things. So I mentioned at the outset that there are two discriminations you have to make. One is fine <coughs> auditory discriminations. Another place where that comes in is, is in, in finger placement. If you want to, whether that's in tune or not, it depends on exactly where you put your finger. So uh, and that requires fine motor control, but it also requires learning to distinguish the correct note from the incorrect one which may be just a millimeter away on the, king, on the fingerboard. So how do, we, how do teachers help students with that problem? Well, in the beginning 
teacher will put stickers on the fingerboard. If you put stickers on the fingerboard, what you're teaching the kid is to place your finger on a sticker. And that shortcuts paying attention to and becoming uh, finely tuned to the uh, actual pitch of the correct note. So uh, that's another area you know, you, you, this, these fine motor coordinations uh, involving intonation uh, are, are not effectively taught with uh, those stickers which introduce a cue for correct performance that's much easier and quicker to learn about and is apt to overshadow and perhaps block learning about the critical thing which has to do with this really fine motor uh, uh, coordination and, and uh, fine uh, perceptual uh, identification of what's in tune. So we have to re be really careful about these things. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, stickers, certainly uh, kids sound better if notes are indicated <laughs> with stickers on a fingerboard, but you can't uh, let that control the performance for very long. What you, what you have to do is perhaps reduce the size of the stickers rather quickly and, and then fade them out and eliminate them and, and hope that the performance remains intact because otherwise you're actually disrupting performance. So paying attention to uh, these fundamental uh, principles of learning that go back as far as uh, Pavla uh, really uh, makes you think a little bit more critically about exactly how you're going about some of these uh, learning tasks. So uh, at the outset of this segment, I played the beginning of the uh, prelude to uh, the second of the Bach cello suites. Uh, so I'll play the rest of, uh, rest, rest of this piece. And what's particularly inter of interest in uh, this piece is that Bach wrote this thing after he returned from a, uh, a summer uh, visit with the court that he was working with. Uh, they went to, uh, for several months uh, to Italy for the summer, and when Bach and the rest of the court returned to uh, Germany, Bach uh, learned for the first time uh, that his wife had passed away and uh, his children uh, were uh, being cared for by other members of the family. So he was obviously tremendously grief-stricken by uh, this news, and uh, this is what he wrote uh, during uh, that period. <laughs> 